First, Wake Forest faculty. He earned his PhD in history from the University of Texas at Austin and an MPhil and MA in history from JNU. His primary areas of teaching and research including local, urban and literary histories within the context of colonial and cultural encounters. He is the author of Local Everyday Islam and Modernity, Kasbah Towns and Muslim Life in Colonial India, where he looks at two Tehsils in UP. Four Kasbahs. Four Kasbahs in UP. Two in the western part, two in the eastern yes. part of UP. And the co-editor of the Cambridge Companion to Sayyid Ahmed Khan. Currently, Rice is working on a social history of Bombay in particular its cosmopolitan nature and the role certain specific Muslim communities played in its social makeup. It's interesting that he is uh, co-edited this volume on Sayyid Ahmed Khan and is speaking on Badruddin Tayyabji. <coughs> in some ways parallel, but in some ways very divergent personalities. It's difficult to believe now that in the late 19th and early 20th century, Bombay was at the center of India's development of political consciousness in India. And in fact, the institution founded jointly by Badruddin Tayyabji with Firosha Mehta and Telang was the Bombay Presidency Association, in, which, in whose premises the first Indian National Congress met. And of course, he presided over it two years later in 1887. And he and uh, he... He makes the point about people from all communities joining and meeting at the Indian... The Congress was not a party. The word Congress was used as the word Congress means in the English language, which means a meeting. At different Congresses, we shall do this, they're talking. And he's trying to get to ensure that all communities come to take part in it. And a strong section of the Muslim intelligentsia, led by Sayyid Ahmed Khan, violently objecting to it. I don't see what purpose is being served. And this small concession you are making to the others by saying we shall only discuss items of common interest, in which case there is nothing of common interest. Basically, this thing is only my. So it's a very interesting thing that you are bringing up. Tayyabji himself was a very interesting personality who in different ways continues to impact on India even today. So let's not waste more time. Request Sayyid to start his presentation. Production. And for the invitation to present and share some of my research here, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Sina, and thank you, uh, Dr. Ravikant Mishra. I'm really looking forward to my interactions with you and learning more from you as I present something out of my work in progress, uh, general, basically, history of uh, Bombay Muslims uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. So it's coming from that. It's uh, basically Tayyabji's are one family, one clan that I'm looking at in that larger work. So, I, in this paper, I basically try to situate uh, Tayyabji, Badruddin Tayyabji, as a figure, as an entry point to understand what was going on in the social and political worlds of Bombay at the time, uh, during the time that he lived. So, Badruddin Tayyabji lived the proverbial life of an Indian and a Muslim in 19th century India. Writing about him in 1905, Mahatma Gandhi captured the essence of his contributions, and I quote, Badruddin Tayyabji is a famous name throughout India, particularly in the Bombay Presidency, where he is known to all. Mr. Badruddin was perhaps the first Indian from the Bombay Presidency to go to England. He excelled in his studies, won many laurels in England, and then returned to Bombay. He earned a great reputation as an able barrister and was always compared to English barristers. He successfully fought cases in which he had to confront the famous barristers and uh, and inverity. During the period of his practice at the bar, there was hardly a big case in which he was not engaged by one or the other party. Just as Justice Tayyabji has earned a name in his scholarship and legal profession, so has he won fame in public life too. He has done so much to, for the spread of education in India, particularly among Muslims. He always encourages the education of women. His wife and daughters are all well educated. He has taken an active part in the politics of the country and has done much work in collaboration with Justice Ranade. He was a prom prominent worker of the Indian National Congress and has also presided over it. His presidential address was so good that it still ranks as one of the best speeches. 
though he is now sitting on the bench, he is as patriotic as ever. He takes interest in educational matters. By nature, he is kind and humble. His knowledge of Hindustani is as profound as his knowledge of English. Few in the Bombay presidency can match him in Urdu oratory. Unquote. Despite his intriguing life and the deep impact he made on his community and region, the story of Badruddin Tayyabji has never been fully told, except a few short biographies, and with the exception of an excellent biography by his son, Hussein Tayyabji. What does his life history or biography tell us, and why does it need to be retold and redeemed today? In his famous essay, Bibliographical Illusion, noted French scholar Pierre Bordeaux criticized most life histories by comparing them with the description of a trip in the metro that did not take into account the matrix of the structure of the network. That is, the matrix of objective relations between different stations. Instead, Bordeaux argued for a view of life uh, history, for a view uh, of life history that sees it in terms of a series of positions successfully occupied by the same agent or group in a space itself in flux and undergoing incessant transformation. In this spirit of the larger contexts and coherence under which an individual operates, Badruddin Tayyabji's life is about the different positions he held and operated under, and it is under the collective contexts under which he lived that makes his story far more relevant and worthy of being reconsidered. As a lawyer, a judge, a leader, an orator, a political activist, a nationalist, an educator, and a social reformer, his life was intricately linked with a number of other individuals within and outside Bombay, the city and the presidency, as his life would be incomplete without his link with the many individuals of his time, so will be the lives of others who inhabited his time and his space, and, and even, even those who came after him. The expansion of trade and the lure of wealth had attracted migrant groups of the city of Bombay uh, as, its important, as its importance as a port increased. Bombay, which was second to Calcutta and Madras up until the early 19th century, soon became the home of migrants as its foreign shipping developed. By the middle of the 19th century, a class of wealthy ship owners, shipbuilders, and merchants belonging to the varied constituents of the city, of which Mus Muslims were an integral part, came into being. This class was outward-looking, modern, and generally reformist in outlook. Parsi, Gujarati, and Maharashtrian, or Maharashtrian, its goal of social reform, education, as well as political awareness, were gradually beginning to be perceived as goals held across communities and increasingly across regions. Bombay was thus host to several ethnic communities, and Muslims were an important partners. Examining the Bohras within this network, of which Badruddin Tayyabji was a representative, uh, uh, enables us to navigate Bombay's cultural makeup and trace links between Muslims and the nature of diversity and cosmopolitanism they inhabited and helped forge. In larger works pertaining Bombay as an economic and commercial network, the significance of Muslim figures in, the, er, in both early modern and modern economy and commerce are well treated by scholars like Chaudhary and Dasgupta and many others. But their cumulative role in the making of the Bombay's diverse and cosmopolitan character and social and cultural life is far from acknowledged. From Badruddin Tayyabji and the larger Tayyabji clan that served in the fields of education, law, and administration in the 19th century to Seth Chotani, as a representative political figure who joined hands with nationalist leaders during the famed Khilafat movement of the 1920s. Muslim contribution to the larger and local social and intellectual makeup is indubitable. An imprint of the philanthropic contributions of Adam G. P. Bhoy, for example, that he started in the 19th century, that he started in the 19th century, late 19th century, is still felt in parts of the city. So there's significant culture of philanthropy that also existed at the time by many other individuals, such as Peer Boy. Exploring individuals such as these and communities, including the Bohras, the Khojas, the Memans, the Konkanis, the Momis, 
uh, the Deccanis and the various subgroups and reflecting local converts as well as those of Arab, Persian and Indic descent, I seek to examine how they helped shape the society they lived in by participating in the local educational bodies such as Anjuman -e Islam, political entities such as Indian National Congress and local bodies such as city councils and municipal boards, endowments and trusts. The Tayyabji family in general and Badruddin Tayyabji in particular serves as a key example of this endeavor. Considering Bombay's Muslim families and the Tayyabji clan as pivotal to Muslim social life and Indian nationalist politics also enables us to move beyond the narrative of Islam in South Asia that has traditionally privileged North India's Muslims. It is not much known that all of the eight sons of Tayyab Ali, father of Badruddin and the patriarch of the family, went to London for higher studies at a time when most Muslims in India were opposed to the very idea of Western education. Most of them, upon return, most of the sons, uh, served as barristers and pursued successful careers. Tayyabji Bhaimiya and Faz Heather were two brothers who had moved from Kambe to Bombay. Kambe was a hub for this community as it remained a critical port for trade with China in cotton, opium, and carnelian. Several families had spread to major mercantile centers such as Bombay, Surat, Ahmedabad, and Baroda. Bhaimiya had emerged as a recognized community leader as well as close, a close friend of the governor of Bombay. He was also appointed as the Justice of, Pe uh, of the Peace. He was quick to adopt West European professional skills and social manners, having himself traveled to Europe and performed Hajj in 1853, he encouraged his family to venture out and explore the world. He first sent his two sons to England. His third son, Kamruddin, went to England in 1852 and returned in 1858 as a solicitor. His third son, uh, his fifth son, Badruddin, returned to India in 1867 as a bar at law. Amiruddin, the youngest, was educated in England as well. Other sons followed after them. Together, they practiced in the family-run firm S. Tayyabji and Company. They were the first Indians to practice law in Bombay, and their branches extended to Havre in France and in Karachi. The next generation continued this trend even further. While Badruddin's son went to England, his daughters became conversant in English. By mid-1870s, uh, at the time when the Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College was being founded in Aligarh, an idea that would still take some time to set in among the most Muslims in North India, all of the Tayyabji children were attending missionary schools. Boys went to St. Xavier's, where girls, whereas girls to Zanana Bible Mission School in Girgaon, the first girls' school in Bombay, and later to Alexandra School for Girls in the Fort area of the city. They simultaneously received lessons in Persian and Urdu at home and in the Quran. Summing up his memory of Badruddin Tayyabji, Reverend Dr. Dougal Machikan, the well-known Scottish missionary, educationist, and later the principal of Wilson College, and later the vice chancellor of the University of Bombay between 1888 to 1891, remarked the following, and I quote, those who were admitted to intimacy with him knew that he was the center of his family. And in the bosom of that family and of that cultured home, he was enabled to develop those qualities which gained for him the admiration of their city. He was in one sense the truest leader of his people and of this city. He was the leader in educational and political reforms. He was their leader in social amelioration. And when they remembered the noble stand which, the, which he took on behalf of the women of his people and what he did for the advancement of women, they would unite in honoring the memory of such a man." Uh, unquote. Born on 8 October 1844, Badruddin Tayyabji was the eighth child of his parents, and two more, were, two more were born after him. He learned Urdu and Persian at Dada Makhraz Madrasa, and subsequently joined the Elphinstone Institution. After a few years there, he was sent to France for the treatment of his eyes and on being cured, he went to London and joined the Newbury High Park College uh, right after he had turned 16. 
Upon matriculating from London University, he eventually became a law student at the Middle Temple, and in April 1867, he was called to the bar. Badruddin Tayyabji returned to India, and in November of that year, 1867, he set up his own practice at Bombay High Court, being the first Indian barrister of the place, as his brother had been the first Indian solicitor, Kamruddin, before him. Some, sur surmounting some initial hitches, he was able to rise very soon to the front, ra front rank of his profession. In his 62 years of lifetime, until his death in 1906, Tayyabji emerged as a multifaceted personality, playing critical role in his profession first as a barrister and later as a judge, as an educationist, a social reformer, and someone determined to instill nationalist, nationalist spirit in his fellow countrymen. His conspicuous absence from historiography underrates the diverse and deeply influential roles that he played in, the variety, in a variety of contexts and the legacies that he left behind for the next generations, fighting for Muslim interests in India, social upliftment of the Indians in general, an anti-colonial awakening of people among all religions and creeds. The only moment of celebration in the Indian nationalist historiography is his role in the founding and early leadership of the Indian National Congress. An acknowledgement of his role has been confined to his presidency of the third session of the Indian National Congress held in Madras in 1887. By focusing on episodes from his life and work, I now seek to for, uh, bring forth a flavor of his many contributions and legacies with the intent to situate him in a dialogue with the local and the larger political and social worlds that he inhabited. Contemporary sources such as biographies, correspondence, family histories, newspaper reports, and private papers interview a different story, or may I say, history of Tayyabji, who was not only the first Indian barrister in Bombay and later the first Indian judge to the Bombay High Court, uh, but first Indian Muslim judge, uh, Indian Chief Justice out to the Bombay High Court, but also someone who made time and stepped out of his comfort zone to attend a variety of social and political needs of his compatriots. Badruddin Tayyabji's return to Bombay as a barrister was met with high expectations of him in his community. He enrolled in the High Court of Bombay and worked skillfully, earning genuine love and respect for the British, uh, but not yielding to racial discrimination and subordination. His fame grew throughout the presidency and he traveled widely to advise princes and those in Mafasal, as can be verified from his fee books as he was visiting different places. The family kept extensive record of the activities that went on within the family. Anecdotes after anecdotes testify to his extraordinary ability. His appointment as the judge of Bombay High Court uh, received, uh, as, as the justice of uh, Bombay High Court, received wide acclaim. The editor of Rast Goftar wrote, and I quote, it is not only a great honor to your community and the able family of my old friend Tayyabji Paimiya, but it is an honor to the nation and to us all, the natives of India, whom you so brilliantly represent, unquote. As a judge, Badruddin exhibited independence of mind. No other example shows it, it as much as uh, his eloquent handling of the case of Bal Gangadhar Tilak. Tilak, who had published a series of articles in Kesari, criticizing the lack of adequate medical services in Pune during the occurrence of plague, was arrested. An application for his bail had been rejected by the chief <coughs> presidency manager, sorry, magistrate, Another application met to the division, ben be division bench of the High Court, consisting, uh, cons consisting of Justice Parsons and Justice Ranade, was also unsuccessful. A third petition failed as well. A fourth one was placed when Badruddin Tayyabji was presiding. He wrote in his judgment, and I quote, 
I cannot believe that a gentleman in Mr. Tilak's position would not be forthcoming in the trial. On the other hand, I can quite see that the ends of justice might be defeated if I refuse to grant bail, for it is possible that if he is imprisoned for a month, it might ultimately be found that he was not guilty." Unquote. With his growing popularity, Badruddin Tayyabji had attained some sort of public life which itself was in its infancy in its time. English education was new and there were not many forums for public spirited people. He joined the East India Association that mostly aired the British view. Its Bombay branch served the activities of the intelligentsia as Dadabai Nauruji had desired. It discussed Indian political ideology and the theory of the drain of wealth. Badruddin Tayyabji actively participated in all these activities. But he later became instrumental in the founding of the Bombay Presidency Association, along with Firoz Shah Mehta and Katie Telang, which you just referred to. Both Mehta and Telang kept inviting Tayyabji to join, join public services, public life, until he agreed and relented to their request. And ultimately, the three of them came to be known as the Bombay Triumvirate, the trio of uh, the, th the three. He emerged as an active voice in the emergence of newer associations around which civic leadership was organized, uh, around which civic leadership was organized in the city and presidency. Firoz Shah Mehta had formed the Association of Western India with higher aims compared to the Bombay Association. This association attempted to train people in political observation and discussion and to teach them to understand the administrative polity of the British, British Empire. The declared aims of this association was vigilance in all matters of imperial and local concern, representation of people's wishes to authorities, and dissemination of information to the people. But as institutions such as these dwindled, mostly because of uh, some of the, act the death of some of the active leaders, including Dabolkar and Shankar Seth at this time, Badruddin Tayyabji, even though remaining a part of the Bombay Association, uh, preoccupied himself with his law practice and Muslim questions. Badruddin Tayyabji was uh, also emerged as a leading voice for turning Bombay Municipal Corporation as an elective body. In July 1871, he was among those leading the agitation for an elective Bombay Municipal Corporation and topped the list of those subsequently elected on that body for the next 10 years, winning five terms of two years each. In 1882, Badruddin Tayyabji became a member of the Bombay Legislative Council, but resigned in 1886 on grounds of health. But this, like the ones mentioned earlier, was a testimony to his involvement in public life. By the end of 1870s, the English-educated and mercantile communities, the Shetias, in Bombay, two major stakeholders in the power structure, converged on the question of the Indian cotton. The leading English educated lawyers, according to Christine Dobbin, were much closer to the Shetias than the earlier intelligentsia. The growth of English cotton industry in the mid-19th century was reversing the trend of India's export of cotton goods to England. Local newspapers, such as Native Opinion, Hindu Prakash, Subodh Patrika, were enthusiastic supporters of local goods and local industry. In the middle of 1875, the Government of India published Act No. 16 of 1875, which while, remaining, which while removing the export duty on the Indian cotton yarn and calicos, placed an import duty of 5% on long staple cotton imported into India from Egypt and the United States. On March 12, 1876, Native Opinion published an article titled, India Sold to Manchester. Other newspapers were similarly outraged. In March 1878, more duties were lifted from coarser cotton yarns, and more such steps seemed in the offing. Katie Telang, Fardunji, Mehta, and Tayyabji were among the first leaders of the intelligentsia to emerge and provide their support. They approached several prominent mill owners in order to put together a public meeting and were very successful in organizing uh, uh, a series of meetings. Telang, Mehta, and Tayyabji were later to be called the three political muses of Bombay. So again, the same 
as the triumvirate. In fact, this was Badruddin Tayyabji's first public appearance, other than before his own, uh, uh, before his co-religionists. Another issue that Badruddin Tayyabji forayed in was the Ilbert Field crisis in 1883 that further galvanized Bombay politics. The bill was an attempt to remove an anomaly which prevented Indian covenanted civilians when undertaking judicial duties outside the presidency towns from trying Europeans before, uh, brought before them. Its promulgation caused uproar and outcry and the British community, uh, among the British community. Although Bombay remained rel relatively quiet with fewer British outside of the presidency town, the context reactivated the city's political life. Leaders, including Badruddin Tayyabji, rose in support of the bill. He and others emphasized that a conflict over the bill was a conflict of opposing ideas about the future of India. It was a question of what the Indians were going to get out of their education and uh, as a matter of share in education. In December 1883, Tayyabji visited Calcutta and discussed the question with W.C. Banerjee, an old friend from his student days in London. In Bombay, he addressed two public meetings alongside Katie Thelan and exhibited fiery rhetoric in support of Ilbert Bill, holding that the current provisions degrades, I quote, degrades our own countrymen, unquote, and I quote again, the present state of the law is not only unjust, but it is insulting to us Indians, unquote. Badruddin Tayyabji's engagement also roped in the age limit, the question of age limit of the ICS exam. In August 1884, the Bombay branch of the East India Association held a large public meeting to memorialize government to raise age limit of the Indian civil services. The same group again turned up in December 1884 to bid farewell to Lord Ripon. All the speakers implied that the Indian interests were identical with those of Britain. Tayyabji noted that moderation is better than ex exaggeration. While the Tayyabji brothers went to England, his sisters became conversant in English. By mid-1870s, when in the North, uh, the question of adopting uh, Western education by the Aligarh movement was being questioned by many. All of the Tayyabji clan, as I said, were uh, getting education in English and in missionary schools. Badruddin Tayyabji's role in pushing his community, as well as the larger city, to an agenda of reforms in tandem with social reformer of his, of, uh, of, uh, of his ilk is an example of his contributions to the shared morality that marked the city's life. For instance, uh, he exercised considerable influence on the religious leaders of the Sulamani Bora community in matters such as the futility of how the use of cutlery or tables and chairs was not to be feared and it was to be welcomed. For these were changes that the prophet himself, the icon of progress and of common sense, would have approved of. Badruddin Tayyabji was a close friend of the leading social reformer, uh, Rana Day, and Kamruddin helped, uh, and, and his brother Kamruddin, both, both of them uh, uh, basically allied with Rana Day to protect a young Maharashtrian girl from the consequences of child marriage. When he went to Madras to preside over the Indian National Congress meeting in 1887, his eldest son, Mohsin, recorded in the family journal that it was a matter of great source of pride for all Muslim, and especially for our Kabila, the pride, uh, the family or tribe. Sakina, one of his daughters, writes of a committee of women that she was, uh, that was set up to enable Parda observing women to participate in social reform activities. Badruddin Tayyabji campaigned against Parda all his life, holding that it went far beyond the Quranic injunctions. His was among the first Muslim family to discard it. His daughters were the first to be sent abroad, uh, sorry, not abroad, but sent to uh, English educational institutions. And he himself supported the Age of Consent Bill, 1891, despite both Hindu and Muslim opposition. As the president of the third session of the Indian National Congress in 1887, which was attended by 607 delegates, Tayyabji insisted on the inevitable alliance among Muslims, Hindus, Parsis, and Christians for the common benefit of all, and, the re and he emphasized the rep representative character 
of Congress. Like Sayyid Ahmad Khan, he was concerned with the distress and despair of the Muslim community. He held that education was key for the advancement of everyone and that was needed and that was something that the Muslims needed as well. It was due to his two brothers, Kamruddin and uh, due to the two brothers, Kamruddin and Badruddin, that Bombay got its first organization for the promotion of Muslim educational interests. The Tayyabji brothers had also organized the Sarmaye Jamaat Sulemani to feed, clothe and educate boys of their own community who managed to get to Infanston High School. Their endeavors attracted the interest and friendship of Muhammad Ali Roge, a member of the Roge shipbuilding family. Roge was in early 20s and a landlord of great wealth and position. Well educated, he was attracted by the idea of Sayyid Ahmad Khan and had met Ghulam Muhammad Munshi who spoke to Roge about the Anjumans, the associations that had been established in, the, in several cities to help Muslims. Roge consulted with the Tayyabjis and in March 1876, the Anjuman Islam of Bombay was founded. Tayyabji helped found this institution to redress the poor educational facilities available to Muslims. The Anjuman's aim was the amelioration of the Mohammedan community and to effect some improvement in their education and moral and social state. Badruddin Tayyabji became its secretary in 1877. The Tayyabji brothers were very clear that their voicing of Muslim interests was not at all in conflict with their advocacy of a unified Indian identity that cut across divisions of all kinds. They laid out the foundation of Anjuman Islam, which stood uh, for the betterment and upliftment of Muslims in every direction. Its working principle, as defined by Badruddin Tayyabji, was not to take the initiative when the interests of Muslims were common with the rest of the people of India, but to consider it as a duty to take initiative if the interests of Muslims alone were affected and if they were affected more than those of the others. So, as a way to conclude, uh, in 19th century India, Badruddin Tayyabji was among the leading few voices of political, social, educational and civic uh, reforms with a public life that was brimming with activities. The vision that he laid out was a political representation, educational access, gender reforms, and cross-religious alliances, as much relevant today as they were in those days. He had a lion's share in local politics, beginning with the municipal corporation and leading up to his involvement in the nationalist politics of the time and charted the path for the future generations to come. The Bombay that he inhabited and the needs of his community and region shaped his work as they got shaped in return. A close study of a life such as his open up, uh, opens up the vistas of understanding the city's civic, cosmopolitan, diverse and ever-changing life. Last but not least, it supplements and enriches an understanding of Muslim life in India. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for bringing out so much that many of us were not very aware with. <coughs> One of course this very interesting point which comes, Madhuran Tayyabji, barrister, 1895 becomes judge, becomes a chief justice, Justice Rana Day. They are both members of the establishment and yet they are also in their own way activists and social reformers. That's a, something which, of course, at that stage was different. <coughs> Party one could say that they were both made judges as a process of co-option by the Raj, so that, you know, they don't cross the line and become too offensive. The other thing which really struck me in when you were speaking is uh, people like Badruddin Tayyabji and to that extent Muhammad Ali Jinnah also, who got into public life in Bombay in the very big way at this time, and who felt that religion had no place in life, in public life. Religion was very important, but in, not in public life. Of course, Jinnah was paradoxical in the sense that he changed his name to a more Muslim name when he went to study in England, from Jinnah Bhai becomes Jinnah, etc. But yet, and through the Khilafat movement, and Gandhi's championing of the Khilafat cause, that pushed 
Abu Badrun Teju was long dead. People like Jinnah out of the Congress into saying that. So it's a very <coughs> paradoxical situation where these people have been fighting for social reforms within the Muslim community and for Hindu and Muslim to work together. And yet, at a certain amount of time, they find themselves being feeling marginalized by sheer numbers at the end of the day, you know. <coughs> My basic point is, therefore is would be, how would somebody like Badrudin Tayyabji and others look at the role of religion in kind of public life? And related to that is, he and Sayyid Ahmad Khan were both very, very strong on Western education, very strong on Western education, which you brought out very strongly. <coughs> the difference, of course, was that Sayyid Ahmad Khan was from the United Provinces, where, thanks to education, the Muslim predominance of the civil services, the Tehsildars and the Sekhtas magistrates, was now being challenged by Hindus in greater numbers. But Tayyabi did not suffer from any such angst. So therefore, the attitude towards the Congress was very different. But look at education, they were both on the same side. Against somebody like, say, Shibri Nuwani, who was completely, who wanted Western education, but who wanted to view it through the eyes of a Muslim and through the eyes of India. And therefore, Nuwani was making, while working in Aligarh, I think was very critical of this approach to modernity. Mm -hmm. If you could just react on these two, yeah. and, then we'll, and then we'll throw it open. Yeah. I think... <coughs> Thank you for these wonderful points. You know, basically. So I, I, I'm completely in agreement with you when, when you when you said that religion was considered something very private, right? Not in the public life. At the time of uh, Badruddin Tayyabji in the 19th century, things, of course, change as uh, religion comes to the forefront of public life in the early 20th century onwards. Uh, I think it's hard to fathom how Badruddin Tayyabji would have reacted to that. But for him, uh, religion remained an integral part of his life, right? Not public life, but his integral life. Right? And that's why he continued to engage with differing levels and degrees with his own community. So oftentimes with the Soleimani Bohra community, the larger unit would be the Muslim community in Bombay. Yeah, and, 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 and the larger cause of the Anjuman Islam, uh, which was basically an education institution, that started with uh, a very small beginning, but uh, spread out to be a much larger uh, network. Uh, he uh, did not see any contradiction between, uh, say, a non-religious public life and a religious private life. Right? So that, that's, that's how probably he, how he negotiated and navigated himself. Uh, yeah, and uh, when you... I think uh, since you brought Sayyid Ahmad Khan, uh, it's, it's, both the figures were very much different. They lived around the same time. And, where, uh, and they also had sort of family backgrounds were very different. You know, his family came from uh, Bombay. Bombay was much more exposed to the Western culture, more cosmopolitan. And he also went and got an education for himself in England. So that allowed him, one, a different kind of worldview that he inherited, being a citizen of Bombay, and later on what he had gained in terms of education. Sayyid Ahmad Khan came from a family that basically initially, if you, you know, some, some of the early writings of Sayyid Ahmad Khan is about so, some sort of lamentation about the decline of the Mughals, right? So that, so he's also, he's basically seeing that decline and is figuring out what to do. And then he goes to London in the late 1860s and finds that there's more that the Western culture has to offer. And maybe adopting that would equip one with tools with which one can progress further. So he's using that. Uh, so his educational background is a bit different too because he's, you know, he's coming from a very traditional uh, Arabic, Persian education, but his exposure is mostly as a, in the form of a traveler, right? But he is very much impressed. Uh, more, most impressed he is with the science and technology and of course the Oxbridge model that he implements in the Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental College. So. Uh, they, both of them also differ in public life with regard to their participation in the Indian National Congress uh, because uh, uh, Tayyabji is all about Muslims getting along with everybody and participating in uh, the Indian National Congress. <coughs> Sayyid Ahmad Khan is not essentially against that, but he, his viewpoint is that the Muslim community is lagging so much behind because Raja Ramon Rai and other reformers 
uh, among Hindus, among Parsis, among Sikhs, had advanced the cause of education, that he thinks that the Muslims first need to get up on their feet by gaining education. And it's only when you're educated enough, then you plunge into any kind of political life. So he's not against Congress politics of the time, but he does not want to participate in that. Right? So that's what he's doing. Shibli Numani, of course, as you rightly summed up, he is part of the Aligarh movement, but then he sees that difference with Sayyid Ahmad Khan, and he parts his ways, comes up with his own institution, uh, and, and, and goes off uh, from there. So, thank you. Open to questions. <coughs> uh, you, and then lady behind you. Yeah, please. Can you the mic, please? Yeah, yeah I will. Uh, my name is Anil Naurya. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I just like to. Uh, my question is not about uh, what you said alone, but what emerged in the discussion between the two of you. Uh, you see, uh, you brought up Jinnah. Uh, the question is, uh, there is a widespread cons impression that uh, Jinnah uh, moved away from the Congress because of the Khilafat question. Actually, at the 1920 session of the Muslim League, Jinnah says he calls Khilafat a life and death question for Muslims. He's not, he's not against the Khilafat demand. What he is against is the mass movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just wanted to uh, clarify Absolutely. that point. And, uh, well, uh, about uh, Shibli Nomani, uh, I think, again, that's a... <coughs> Shibli Numani really falls into the Baduddin line so far as the attitude to the Congress is concerned. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he differs from the uh, Sir Sayyid line. Uh, I think, I'm, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he makes the point that the educational and the political can go simultaneously. Just as Ranade is making the point that yeah. the social and the political can also go simultaneously. Which is the line then taken up by Gokhale and Gandhi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely in agree agreement with you, yes. Behind you there. Uh, frankly, I haven't studied much more in details about how he helped the princess out. But the only thing I have seen is in the form of his engagement as to when, when he was paid some fees about for, for his legal consultation. Uh, so, of course, as, 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 as he gradually emerged as one of the uh, preferred lawyers in the Bombay High Court, different people reached out to him. And he took quite a few high-profile cases. Uh, during his uh, lifetime, and uh, he represented uh, uh, different, I, I, I cannot give you the names of different princes, but uh, uh, mostly, uh, you know, pe people who basically asked him for their cases to because Bombay High Court was the hub for Bombay Presidency. So all including Bhopal and, and the surrounding the Bombay Presidency, uh, native uh, princely states, uh, uh, asked him for help, and he was uh, he represented some of those cases. So I think there's one one article that I remember of uh, maybe A.G. Nurani mentions a little bit about that, uh, which has some examples in that, which I do not remember off my head. Yeah, thank you. Respond to your point. Jinnah immediately realized that once mass politics comes in, he would not stand a chance. So that was a very obvious the kind of a thing. <coughs> yes.
So you you mean the people of Bombay? So there's the, the Sayyid Ahmed Khan and Badruddin Tayyabji, they disagreed on the question of Muslim participation in the Indian National Congress. But they kept uh, an ongoing conversation about that. So both of them uh, exchanged a lot of letters and they wrote about their own uh, causes that they believed in. And uh, there's not, not, a way, not as a way to convince one or the other their point. So, for example, uh, Badruddin Tayyabji writes uh, in one of the letters that, you know, why, why would Muslims not just participate with others in the, in a moment, beyond, beyond my comprehension, right? So there are these kinds of things that they're discussing among, among uh, each other. Now the question of why, uh, I think if I got your question right, uh, so you're saying on the one hand that Tilak and his followers in Bombay are very active in mass politics at this time. Yeah, yeah. So Tilak, of course, was more, much more of a mass leader than a person like Badruddin Tayyabji. Badruddin Tayyabji was, uh, as, as I said, he made he started making some of the public appearances much later than his, you know, the other engagements with education and such. Uh, Badruddin Tayyabji, uh, I think, if you compare him with Tilak. Uh, he was, I think, in, in terms of their patriotic involvement with the International Congress at the time, uh, could be placed similarly. But when it came to, uh, say, mass mobilization, Tilak is a mass mobilizer at the time, and Tayyabji was more of an intellectual and ideologue. In, in a mass leader in the sense of Tilak, right? Because the extremist wing of the International Congress at this time, which is basically focused around organizing masses, right? Which Tilak is doing. So, uh, similar to Tilak, he's writing a lot, right? So, he's, it's not, so there are different ways as to how you can reach the mass, masses. So, you can reach the masses by, say, making public speeches, or you can reach the masses by writing about a public cause and connect uh, about that in a pop popular forum in newspapers. So, Tayyabji was doing all of that. Uh, of course, he was not, uh, for example, involved as much as Tilak was involved in the form of Ganpati festival, right, and the Shivaji festival, which became uh, huge movements in terms of the gathering of the masses, uh, masses in a physical space. So Tayyabji was not doing that, but he was writing extensively. He was participating in all these activities, as you know, and he's uh, going to the public forums. He's making speeches about child marriage. He's uh, making speeches about, you know, atrocities on women, on why... Uh, uh, girls' education is important, so he's connected to the masses in a different way. So I think uh, there's a perception of, a uh, different perception of what a mass leader is. So what I said was mass leader as Tilak, you know, which, which is a different plane. Yes. Just to add a sentence or two, uh, okay. is that uh, at that time political life was a limited political life of the elite. So Badun Tayyabji, as a leader of the elite portion, made one thing. Tilak, incidentally, doesn't have the same background. Chiplun ka hai. Links are with Pune, not with Bombay. So it changes your whole mindset in that sense. And his ability then to do the Sarajani Ganesh Utsav changes the discourse completely. You know? So in that sense, they are in that sense coming also from different backgrounds. You know? um, we see that uh, from uh, the late 18th and early 19th century, ever since the establishment of, gradual establishment of the British Raj in India, among the Muslim elite, uh, certainly in North India, but I presume that uh, in parts of Eastern and Western India also, there was a deep-seated sense or emerging sense of uh, insecurity about uh, the political retreat of Islam in some sense. And of course the British projected it as such that we have taken power from the Muslims actually. Mm -hmm. This is how they put it, and I think this, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of claim of the British also played uh, some role in shaping uh, the elite Muslims' mind about uh, the fact of having ceded power to the British. And uh, so this insecurity was found among considerable sections of the elite. You referred to uh, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. It was basically an insecurity that he had, which he expressed in uh, terms of education and uh, development of the community. 
and i believe that it was ultimately this insecurity that uh, led to the partition of india and to jinnah's uh, you know uh, belligerent uh, politics uh, initially he was, his politics was very different but gradually he also got infected if i can <laughs> use this word with this uh, you know sense of insecurity when he wanted weightage for the muslim community he wanted parity with the caste muslims etc etc and badruddin uh, as you say was very, very different in that sense so do you find any uh, you know uh, sense of lament or uh, you know any sense of insecurity in badruddin tayyab ji about the uh, you know um, political retreat of islam either in the indian subcontinent or anywhere else does he sort of uh, accept the modern accept modernity as an instrumentalist sort of thing or does he accept it wholeheartedly so <clears throat> let me go back to sayyid ahmed khan a little bit so sayyid ahmed khan initially was lamenting in a similar fashion as you know the the shahar ashok you know that decline of the culture oriental culture uh, the kind of literature that emerged in the late 19th century mostly from north india which complained about the loss of power right so basically and how to grapple with that sayyid ahmed khan came from that standpoint and he one of the things that he did he did many things he you know he went on top of kutub minar and he was measuring each and everything by tape uh, maintaining a do- documented record of the archi- uh, the architecture of delhi which was published as a, in an encyclopedic volume called asar sanadid uh, he one of the things that he did after that was uh, he translating ayne akbari right so when he translated ayne akbari uh, he asked galib to write a preface for that so when he approached galib galib said uh, okay if you want i will write a preface for that but he wrote in persian uh, in in a poetry form and what he basically said is that why are you lamenting on things bygone rather you should be looking up and thinking about what is right with the british that they are doing uh, some, they must be doing something right that they are in a position of power today so maybe it's time that you should also learn about that question and that was a kind of a turning moment for sayyid ahmed khan so he started thinking about you know what to do and he goes to <coughs> london he comes back and he starts admiring does not mean mean that he becomes he surrenders himself to the british uh, model but what he does is he adopts the model as a tool that he thinks would be useful for his community right so english education let's use it educate everybody and then we'll be at a parity with the british to deal with them right so that's his idea badruddin tayyab ji does not uh, of course he he so there there's a there's a context to that because uh, sayyid ahmed khan comes from a traditional aristocratic mughal family right so basically his family served in the mughal nobility right so he's coming from that so he's seeing that decline the power enjoyed by the previous generations now is no longer and that's how he joins the east india company and starts working with them for uh, the context of badruddin tayyab ji is very different right so tayyab ji bhai mein the grandfather the patriarch he moved from kambay to bombay and he made a fortune right so he basically started literally as an urchin and by the time of his death in i think 1853 he had about 5 lakhs 5 lakh rupees right so that he built when his first son was born he had accumulated i think about 20000 rupees by that time and then he threw a huge party and tents were erected everywhere and there was a fire that uh, broke out and everything was gutted so he basically had gone to zero right so zero to 20000 then again zero to 5 lakh so that was his story uh, badruddin and tayyab jafai mia he has written his own uh, small memoir in which he talks about you know the kind of things he does and sees and he is also widely traveled so his his world view is very different so encountering the british which is something that i also argue in my kasba book is that the uh, the, the, the muslims of india is in a position to basically deal with the british as a, yet another episode because they have lived in a culture and uh, environment of pluralism right so they have been meeting with interacting with on an on a day to day basis with other communities ethnicities call whatever uh, they are and then they see the british right so he is not seeing that the british are actually uh, coming as a challenge and it's affecting the community rather he sees and grabs it as an opportunity right so that's what he does uh, one thing that he does point out 
is that the community is running behind. So he's seeing that, look, the Hindus are far more educated. Because if you look at Bombay city, as well as the presidency, and if you look at 1881-1891 census reports, uh, the percentage of uh, educated people is far higher among the Hindus and then the Parsis, right? Parsis sometimes, basically, they're running ahead of the Hindu community, but the Muslims are really running behind. So he's basically trying to address that. So his focus is different. He's not looking back. Just to add to that, gentlemen want to ask a question there. We'll take your question and your question. Uh, considering the life of Tayabji, uh, we learned that uh, there should be no religion in your public life, but immense influence of religion in your personal life. I would like to understand the background that which made Tayabji the person he became. And what message can we take today for our political system and religious feelings mm -hmm. to run our own country? Well, uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the leading families of Bombay of that time um, contributed a lot to building the public monuments and spaces, parks, etc., for the for the local populace. Yeah. You haven't mentioned that aspect at all in this, yeah. in your talk. No, thank you very much, yeah, I think, yeah. I uh, just wanted to make a question. Just an intervention uh, to make, uh, to uh, encourage uh, some thinking on this. Uh, what, you know, what is the impact of death? Uh, but Tayabji's death. You know, sometimes uh, in a political scenario, mm -hmm. when one person is taken away, it has some impact on this, what happens thereafter. Uh, Gandhi dies, socialists leave the Congress. Now, Tayabji dies, and it's striking that all of a sudden, you have this split in the Congress, you know. So I was just wondering if you looked into Tayabji's place in the Congress, uh, whether he was acting as a cementing force in the factions with him, you know, the Bombay, Bombay based factions, mm -hmm. and whether this had some impact on subsequent developments. Even separate, British also react. Yeah. There's a separate electorates yeah. coming just then. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting point to explore. Yeah, no, thank you. I think I, I would definitely love to, you know, explore that. It's a very good point. Uh, yeah, so, and I, you know, I, I, I would definitely, you know, as I expand my work, I would be interested in exploring more of that. So, of course, I have done that a lot with the Pirwai families, in which I'm looking at the construction of hospitals and public parks and many other, uh, uh, basically, facilities of public usage that they're involved. But I think I need to basically uh, look at more with regard to the Tayabji families. So, thank you for that point. Uh, your question, of course, is, is very interesting, but also a difficult one to answer. Uh, uh, when you, uh, one thing that I would begin with in response to your question is that uh, contexts are always changing, right? So there's, there's, there's a certain kind of public life that was around that time, and especially with regard to your question about mass politics as well, is that, you know, there's, there's, there's no mass politics, in the late 19th century. There's a little mass politics uh, that starts coming up in the time of Tilak. When you look at Gandhi's mass politics later on, then the Tilak mass movement kind of fades, fades out a little, right? So there's different elements as, as we go along, different leaders and come. Of course, one would not have been possible with the other. So Gandhi's mass movement probably owes uh, or, or a lot to what came before. So he was able to basically build on that. So similar to that, I would say with regard to religion, that there was a period in which uh, they probably successfully saw as they dealt with the social and the civic life, the religious and the civic life. So they thought that the, you, know, the, you, you could talk about one in one context and not at the other. As we see increased polarization around political questions, uh, especially after the Khilafat movement, uh, by this time, uh, religion is out in the public life. So Sandria Freitag, uh, you know, has done some wonderful research about, and, and Gail Minow's research too, about uh, religious symbolism, which becomes part of the so political movements at this time in the 1920s, 30s, uh, and 40s. So basically that leads to, you know, uh, it's, it's basically uh, something that could not be undone, right? So uh, I don't know if... Uh, 
Well, I, I think if one can take a lesson from uh, the Tayyabji's approach, uh, is if, if one wants to, uh, about how uh, religion can be a private affair, uh, how religion can be about your own personal belief, how it can be practiced by you, and uh, it's basically ultimately about you and uh, your approach to God, right? And it does not necessarily have to be talked about, practiced, and, and flaunted, uh, you know, used or used as a symbol in public life. So that, that, that's definitely one of the models. Uh, so we have, you know, in history we have different kinds of models, so we always pick and choose. So it's up to us as to what kind of society we want to make and, and live in. So definitely. Uh, before I wind up, I just wanted to... For one point, uh, you know, is just to highlight what I said in passing, that in UP, Uttar Pradesh, now then United Provinces and the Northwest, Northwest Provinces, as it will be called, I mean, uh, the, the Muslims actually had a higher literacy rate than the Hindus and were far better represented in the levels of government that Indians were open to. So it was very different from what Madhuran Tehabji faced in Bombay. Yeah, we do a number, this is a part of our, what we call Center for Contemporary Studies. I just want to list a few things we are doing in the next one week for those interested. On 7th of January, there's a book release on an outstanding book called Ideology and Identity, The Changing Party System of India by Pradeep Chibar and Rahul Varma, where they bring in that no, Indian politics is not devoured of ideology. There is ideology in different forms. <coughs> they do very detailed study. We have Swapandas Gupta, Rajiv Gauda, both MPs, Mayra Shakil, and Sanjay Kumar who will be discussing it. On the 8th, we are releasing this book, India-China Rivalry in the Globalization Era, edited by T.B. Paul from USA. Udaya Bhaskar releases the book. We have General Narsimhan, Professor Madhu Bhala, and Professor Harsh Pand there. On the 9th at 3 o'clock, Professor Ajay Tiwari, former Delhi University, is speaking on Sahitya Kadesh Kal. He'll be speaking to us. Another book release called 100 Ideas to Improve Governance on 10th of January by Suresh Prabhu. Manoj Pant, Director IFT, is speaking. And we have this book on Sri Lanka called Sri Lanka at Crossroads, Geopolitical Challenges and National Interest by Asanga Abegunasekara. We are hoping to get some good people from Delhi to speak. This is on the 11th. And we have a book on the Aadhaar. So you can see that we have a very large number of activities in the next 10 days. <coughs> For those who have put the email address, you will get invitations. If you haven't and you want to do so, kindly put your email addresses. Now it will be a great pleasure to thank Professor <coughs> Rahman for this wonderful, wonderful talk. As I said, Bombay, Mumbai is something that we don't today attach with being at the forefront of the development of political consciousness in India, which it was, being the primary commercial city of the country. Calcutta was very commercial, but Calcutta also had the government there in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Bombay was also very cosmopolitan, very much linked to the world, fully globalized city those days. So obviously the kind of <coughs> exposure Bombay was going through did not happen in the others. But some over the years we have seemed to have dropped it out of our reckoning that how much of a pioneering city in all which ways. Lady here had mentioned the role in public charities, the kind of institutions which were built up in Bombay, the museums, the hospitals, the schools, by philanthropists, by Indian industrialists, and that is the way, and of course all the other things that you mentioned about. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very, very much. I hope tea is waiting for us outside. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your coming. And once your book thank is you through, you're always welcome to come.